Tonight, on this special edition of 60 Minutes Presents, 21st Century Con. Our hidden cameras captured one of the most outrageous cons we have ever reported. You can't find a surgeon in the world who doesn't support our approach. He's a 21st century snake oil salesman bilking desperate patients out of their life savings. Uh, we've gotten people out of wheelchairs. I'm Scott Pelley. I'm with 60 Minutes. His bogus treatment costs $125,000 cash and promises the impossible. I understand that you have had patients that have stood up and walked away from wheelchairs. There have been patients that have improved to, to that extent. You know, Mr. Stowe, the trouble is that you're a con man. This is what espionage looks like. The man driving the car is Greg Bergerson. He's a civilian analyst at the Pentagon with one of the nation's highest security clearances. His companion is Tai Shin Guo, a spy for the People's Republic of China. Bergerson knew a secret that the Chinese desperately wanted to know, and neither man knows that what they're about to do is being recorded by two cameras the FBI has concealed in their car. Oh, oh, are you sure that yeah, that's yeah, okay? Yeah, Good evening. I'm Scott Pelley. Welcome to 60 Minutes Presents. We've tracked a lot of con men over the years, and tonight you will see some of the most brazen we have ever met. Con men used to travel town to town hawking medical remedies, said to be made of Chinese snakes. Snake oil was useless and dangerous, so the FDA was created to put a stop to it and to other food and drug scams. But today, quack medicine has never been bigger. In the 21st century, snake oil has been replaced by bogus therapies using stem cells. Stem cells may offer cures one day, but medical charlatans on the Internet are making outrageous claims that they can reverse the incurable, from autism to multiple sclerosis to every kind of cancer. Desperate people are being built out of their life savings. As we first reported last April, there is no better window on this crime than the practice of a man who calls himself doctor, a man named Lawrence Stowe. Stowe was unaware that some of his patients had been working with 60 Minutes. One of those patients is Stephen Waters, a college administrator in Lufkin, Texas, who six months before we met him received maybe the worst diagnosis imaginable. He has ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. About 30,000 Americans have ALS at any given time, and like Waters, they all will die, most within five years, as their nervous system gradually disconnects from their muscles. Everything just takes a little longer. I just set things up to where it requires minimal manual effort. Uh, just handling personal hygiene is difficult. Uh, teeth brushing, flossing, very difficult, time consuming. So you just make the adaptations that you can go on. Eventually, Waters will be able to move nothing but his eyes. The same fate is ahead of Michael Martin, who also has ALS. Martin has nearly lost any ability to speak, and very soon he won't be able to walk. I wonder what it was that your regular doctor back home told you about your disease and what your prospects were. It's uh, about two years. You had about two years to live. No patient has ever been cured of ALS. No patient has ever seen the symptoms reversed, even temporarily. But still, desperate people find themselves drawn to a place that promotes the impossible. Stowe Biotherapy in La Mesa, California, near San Diego, which bills itself as a medical oasis. We asked a multiple sclerosis patient to go in with a hidden camera to hear Larry Stowe's pitch for his miracle treatment. That's Stowe telling our MS patient that he can reverse her disease with his program of herbs and vitamins to boost the immune system, custom vaccines, and stem cell injections. 
Medical experts say it's nonsense, but it is the same pitch that we secretly recorded again and again as Stowe claimed to reverse cancer, ALS, MS, Parkinson's disease, and more. We're the only ones who've been able to get anybody that's down here back up to here, and they, they stay back up to here. If we were a major pharmaceutical drug company, you know, we'd be talking about all of our research associating getting Nobel Prizes in medicine and things of that nature. Larry Stowe is not a medical doctor. He claims two PhDs, but we found he only has one in chemical engineering. He had a career at Mobile Oil and holds patents in the oil industry. But by the 1980s, Stowe had taken a strange turn into pseudoscience. For a time, he promoted something called Eon Water, which he said slowed the aging process. And by 2003, he had created the Stowe Foundation to advocate unproven stem cell therapies. Michael Martin, one of the ALS patients helping with our story, had heard about Stowe from a friend. And before we ever met Martin, he'd already given Stowe a down payment of $47,000 to start the treatment. When Dr. Stowe said that he could reverse this disease with stem cells, you thought what? Uh, I'll, 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 <laughs> you wanted to believe. How does Larry Stowe make believers of the desperate? We wanted to see. Steve Waters, glad to meet you, Larry so nice, Stowe. So nice to meet you. So we set up hidden cameras in Michael Martin's home in Houston and invited ALS sufferer Stephen Waters to pose as an interested patient. Stowe came in on crutches. He's missing a leg, which he says he lost to cancer. Everyone in the room knew about our hidden cameras except Stowe. Stowe had claimed what he called a permanent fix for ALS, so we gave Waters questions to ask about Stowe's therapy. So is there a permanent fix from the stem cells? Oh, yes. Yeah. You'll be able to exercise, exercise again. Exercise again. Oh, yeah. Well, if I opt for the uh, permanent fix, will I avoid a feeding tube? Will it keep me out of a wheelchair? Yeah, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we've gotten people out of wheelchairs. Am I going to get closer and closer to at some point you can say, okay, you're cured, you're, you're healed from this disease? I believe that that is 100% possible. Because we've done it with other conditions. I mean, we, we've done it with cancer, you know, which is just a different form of uh, tissue destruction. Did your mother have cancer? My mother. Uh, had pancreatic cancer, and we completely reversed her pancreatic cancer, and she died cancer-free with a healthy pancreas. <laughs> what, what, uh, what, what, what will it cost me for the permanent fix? That'll be around 125000 because it's 50000 for phase one. The stem cell transplant is going to run you around 25000 and then we do follow-up... Uh, uh, therapy after that to make sure the results hold, and that's a, another 50000 Stowe told them they would have to travel to Monterey, Mexico for the treatment. He said his research associate there would take blood-forming stem cells harvested from umbilical cords or bone marrow and inject those cells into their spines. Those blood cells, he said, would transform into nerve or neural tissue that would reconnect with their muscles. Is there a stem cell fix for ALS? No. Professor Sean Morrison is director of the University of Michigan Center for Stem Cell Biology. His lab is one of the world's leading stem cell research centers. So when Stowe says he's going to take blood-forming stem cells, and put them in the spinal cord to create neural cells, what do you make of that? You know, we study blood-forming stem cells every day in this lab, including umbilical cord blood cells, and blood-forming stem cells don't make nervous system tissue. And then what do the injected stem cells do next? Uh, they start to regenerate new nerve tissue and repair the synapses. Stowe's incredible pitch often works because his victims have heard something about the promise of stem cells but don't really know much about them. 
At one time, some scientists thought that blood-forming stem cells could replace any kind of tissue, as Stowe claims. But science now knows that's wrong. Stem cell therapy is the standard of care in only leukemia and certain rare diseases of the blood, nothing else. There is very early research into whether stem cells might one day help ALS patients, but nothing like the claims Stowe is making. Dr. Morrison thinks breakthroughs are years or decades away. He says Stowe's claims are baseless. Classically, people are reporting uh, three to four weeks that they begin to notice the effects. Notice the effects in three or four weeks? You might notice side effects in three or four weeks. You described it as miraculous. That's what it would be. If somebody squirted some stem cells into the spinal cord of an ALS patient and they stood up out of their wheelchair and had a permanent fix, that would be miraculous. But that's what Stowe was promising in Michael Martin's living room as he weaved a pitch with lies of legitimacy. Are you currently working with anybody in the FDA regarding? Oh, yeah. yeah, we, at all levels. Even the University of Texas, he said, was planning to build a research center with a particular name. Stowe uh, Research Center for Regenerative Medicine in affiliation with the University of Texas. You can't find a surgeon in the world who doesn't support our approach. After hearing the pitch, Steve Waters and Michael Martin, working with us, told Stowe they would go to Monterey, Mexico for the treatment. We followed them there with hidden cameras, and we found Stowe's so-called research associate. That's Dr. Frank Morales in the dark jacket. In an email to Waters, Morales claimed, we have treated well over 1,000 patients without any side effects other than positive results, which range from minimal to miraculous. But we have found that Morales is improvising stem cell procedures for profit with no scientific basis. Morales is an American citizen living in Texas with a Mexican medical license. We got the credentials he submitted to one Monterey hospital and found that the medical degree came from a Caribbean school that was later shut down for selling diplomas. Morales dropped out of residency training in Texas. Morales and Stowe took our patients on a tour of the hospital where Morales was already doing stem cell procedures. He explained the techniques he uses. Uh, our team will go into a catheter and place it uh, right up close to into the brain or we'll go into a fecal, you know, right in the spine and, uh, and do other things, you know, that are pretty aggressive. Mexican officials tell us stem cell therapy for ALS is not authorized. The hospital says it didn't know Morales was using stem cells and wouldn't have allowed it. So we can just go right in and, okay, you got your stem cells are out of here. We found one of Morales' former patients, Muna Erickson, in Michigan. She has multiple sclerosis for which there is no cure. What exactly did Morales tell you about what you could expect? He told me that I could expect her to be up out of the wheelchair and walking. She'd get out of the wheelchair mm -hmm. and walk away from it. Mm -hmm. Erickson and her husband Keith are not people with a lot of money, so in desperation, they sold their home in order to wire $15,000 to Morales. The Ericsons say they arrived in a rundown Mexican clinic for a scheduled spinal injection of stem cells, but Morales gave her a stem cell IV instead. So he ended up coming in and hanging an IV off the tip of her thumb that was barely viable. Uh, Muna, show me with your hand, if you can, right here. precisely where that IV went in, right at the tip of your thumb. Yes. What did you think? I thought about taking my wife and taking her home, but she was so set on getting these stem cells. I think she would have had a complete mental breakdown if had I just boarded her back on the plane. Muna, did you get somewhat better? No. I got worse. Back in Monterey, Mexico, Morales and Stowe came to a hotel room where they met patients Michael Martin and Steve Waters. They were expecting to see another down payment, $35,000 in cash. But that is not what came through the door. Mr. Stowe, Mr. Morales, I'm Scott Pelley. I'm with 60 Minutes. What happened next, in a moment.
Stephen Waters and Michael Martin, two ALS patients working with 60 Minutes, traveled to Monterey, Mexico to meet Larry Stowe and Frank Morales. Stowe and Morales said that they could treat the symptoms of ALS with an unproven stem cell therapy. They met in a hotel room that we set up with hidden cameras. Stowe and Morales expected to see a cash down payment of $35,000, but instead we walked in for an on the record interview. Direct spinal cord. I'll get it. That's Larry Stowe sitting on the right. On the couch were Michael Martin and Steve Waters, and Morales was explaining how the stem cell treatment would go. Hey, Steve, Michael. Mr. Stowe, Mr. Morales, I'm Scott Pelley. I'm with 60 Minutes, and I'd like to ask you a few questions uh, on the record about what you propose. I understand that you have had patients that have stood up and walked away from wheelchairs who have ALS. There have been patients that have improved to, to that extent. You've reversed the condition? Yes. You know, Mr. Stowe, the trouble is that you're a con man. Really? You're, you're lying about this protocol. You've lied about your association with the University of Texas. You've lied about your work with the FDA. And now you're lying to these gentlemen about what they can expect. And why do you say that? Nobody at the FDA knows anything about any of this. And the University of Texas is not going to be starting a regenerative medicine clinic with your name on it. Really? When we asked Stowe to back up his ALS claims, his story changed. Give me a Stowe Foundation patient who has ALS who has stood up out of a wheelchair and walked away. We don't have any ALS patients. We have MS patients. We are talking about the, the treatment that you have taken their money for. Is that a treatment that would allow them to stand up out of a wheelchair and walk away? With an ALS patient? No, we've done it with MS patients. I don't believe that's what they understood. Well, I don't then, believe that's what you told them. Then they weren't listening. Can you give, oh, actually, I we were them. listening okay. very carefully. Okay, do you have the tape recordings? I do. Pull them up. I have. Pull them up. I want to hear them. I can do that. Okay. And we did. This was your meeting in Houston. That's right. Just a few weeks ago. Well, if I opt for the uh, permanent fix, what, keep me out of a wheelchair? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. No, we've, we've had uh, a, a number of uh, ALS you know, patients um, be able to get out of their wheelchairs. That's not true, is it? The Stowe Foundation has not. You told Steve that you were going to keep him out of a wheelchair. That's not true either, is it? No, that's very true. You're going to sit here after seeing that, and you're going to look this man in the face and tell him that he's going to stay out of a wheelchair? I mean, that's cruel. Really? What is his prognosis if he doesn't do this? His prognosis is the same either way. No, it's not. Mr. Stowe, you told these men in Houston that a cure was, in, in your memorable phrase, 100% possible. Possible. Is that a guarantee? The folks at home are wondering, what goes through your mind when one of these men pushes a suitcase full of cash across the table to you? What are you thinking? I'm thinking that they came to the right place if they want any hope at all. So is there a permanent fix from the stem cells? Oh, well, yes. Many patients have pinned their hope on Dr. Frank Morales and his improvised stem cell procedures. Recently, he injected stem cells into the spine of a seven-year-old American boy in an attempt to treat the boy's autism, a procedure with no basis in medical science. We found Morales' training is dubious. This is the certificate he presented to a Monterey hospital showing he completed his training at Texas Tech University, but in the interview, he switched schools. Have you ever been licensed to practice medicine I, in the United I, States? I, 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 was, I have, and I worked under uh, University of Texas, where I was at in El Paso, 
and uh, came to Mexico after that. The University of Texas El Paso has no medical school and no record of Morales as a student. But you have a license, or had a license to I, practice in the state absolutely. of Texas. Absolutely. It was an institutional license at the University of Texas, El Paso, Utah, Utah. Utah. So it, you, you can go there and you'll find it. I mean, that's simple. That just, if you did your homework, that's lousiness. I mean, on your behalf. Sorry to say. Not only does he have no credentials from the University of Texas, we found that his Texas Tech credentials are fraudulent. A Texas Tech lawyer told us, where it was obtained or manufactured, I couldn't say, but it was not issued by Texas Tech. Several minutes into the interview, we watched the Stowe-Morales relationship dissolve. Morales walked out, then came back to disavow Stowe. Scott, Scott, yeah, you know, I, I think that just, you know, in the sense of uh, using, you know, his, you know, using him to try to bring me down is that, I think is, is inappropriate. I mean, at least... Sit down and talk to me about it. Uh, well, I... Legal experts tell us that both Stowe and Morales have broken U.S. law, committed fraud, by making a false claim. It doesn't matter that the procedure is done in another country. We wondered why the FDA is not acting against the many stem cell con artists whose websites are up for anyone to see. But the FDA commissioner, Margaret Hamburg, declined to talk with us on camera about any aspect of stem cell quackery. Many experts believe that the FDA is outmatched. Patients need to beware. Larry Goldstein, a prominent stem cell biologist, and researcher Doug Sipp are with the International Society for Stem Cell Research, an organization of the world's leading stem cell scientists. SIP is tracking bogus stem cell clinics all around the world. And how have these operations grown, say, in the last five years or so? I would say the growth has been explosive. I've been tracking it uh, kind of closely for the past three years, and uh, I've been able to come up with more than 200 clinics that are offering some uh, version of stem cells for some type of medical condition uh, for which there's no really uh, good evidence that the stem cells would be either safe or effective. Well, are all of these clinics frauds? On one end of the spectrum, you have people who are doing essentially uh, badly designed, uh, uncontrolled human medical experiments for profit. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you just have thieves who are preying on the sick and their families. Now, an ALS patient might say to you, how could I possibly be worse? This is, this is the question you get sometimes. How could I possibly be worse? I'm going to die. I'm going to die Why not in give two it a try? or three years. Why not give it a try? Well, what if, as a result of this treatment, you ended up in excruciating pain. What if you managed to bankrupt your family through the use of one of these expensive unauthorized treatments so that they can't care for you properly as you decline? There are things that are worse than, than, than your current situation, I think. The experts in stem cell research believe these procedures are at best ineffective and potentially dangerous. A study by UCLA found patients at a Chinese clinic often developed spinal meningitis, but there's rarely any mention of risk on the websites that offer false hope for dozens of afflictions ranging from Down syndrome to cancer. One of the different things now is that the power of the internet now gives just tremendous global reach to people who in the past would be kind of the local quack. So instead of the snake oil salesman standing in the back of a pickup truck, right. he can now reach every ALS patient on earth. And say, come to me and I'll, I'll help you out in Mexico or in Russia or in Thailand. What we see here essentially is Stowe on an industrial scale. Stowe on steroids. Yeah, you could say that. And he might as well be sticking his hands into the pockets of those people and taking the money out without even talking to them. That's, that's how bad I think it is. You know, I wonder what you think when the top people in the field that you pretend to work in call you a snake oil salesman. Comes with the territory. It does come with the territory. We wondered what Stowe would say to the idea of giving Michael Martin his $47,000 back. Has he asked for it? I'm asking. We'd give it back to him. Now that's a deal I'd like to make. Really? Okay. And when he continues to go downhill six months from now and hasn't made any progress, are you going to cover the cost of his care? I'm not buying what you're selling. Fine. Of course, that refund never came. When we first walked into the interview, we thought Stowe might not stay. 
But he sat there for two hours, as though if he only talked long enough, he'd convince us. Thanks for sitting with us and oh, talking yeah. to us. Now you're not running away on me, are you? Well, I was planning on leaving, yes. Okay. I think I'm done. All right. Thank you. You've just cost this man his life. I want you to know that. You know, I don't think so. Okay. Larry Stowe never gave up, even after his lies were exposed. When we left the room, he turned to ALS patient Michael Martin and tried to close the sale. We'll keep in touch. Because I can tell you, and you know what's going to happen. If you don't take some type of aggressive action. The scene at the hotel was the end of the Stowe Morales collaboration. They didn't contact the patients again. Michael Martin and Steve Waters continued to fight the progression of ALS. What would you like to see happen to Larry Stowe? I don't care, Martin said. He has to live with himself. Since our story first aired last April, Lawrence Stowe has closed his business in San Diego. We've learned that the FDA has been investigating Stowe and Morales, but the agency won't comment further. Meanwhile, the ALS patients who helped us with our story are losing ground to their incurable disease. Steve Waters had to retire from the college, and Michael Martin is now in hospice care and can no longer breathe on his own. In our last story, you saw stem cell con men caught by our hidden camera. But in this story, the hidden camera belongs to the FBI. You're about to witness a Chinese spy caught red-handed taking American military secrets from an employee of the Defense Department. China competes with the United States for resources, markets, and strategic advantage. And as we showed you when we first broadcast this story last year, the Chinese are also shopping for information, ranging from U.S. nuclear secrets to the deliberations of the Obama White House. Espionage, by its very nature, is designed to be unseen. So this is an incredibly rare opportunity to witness China stealing America's secrets. There's a, there's a nice Thai restaurant out there. Oh, okay. okay. This is what espionage looks like. The man driving the car is Greg Bergerson. He's a civilian analyst at the Pentagon with one of the nation's highest security clearances. His companion is Tai Shin Guo, a spy for the People's Republic of China. This is Guo in an FBI surveillance photo. He was born in Taiwan, but he's a naturalized American citizen who owns a number of businesses in Louisiana. And this is Bergerson, who worked at the Pentagon's Defense Security Cooperation Agency, which manages weapons sales to U.S. allies. Bergerson knew a secret that the Chinese desperately wanted to know. What kind of weapons was America planning to sell to Taiwan, the rebellious Chinese island that mainland China wants to reclaim? It's July 2007. They're driving outside Washington, and neither man knows that what they're about to do is being recorded by two cameras the FBI has concealed in their car. Okay? Yeah. Are you sure? We watched the tape with John Slattery, the FBI agent at headquarters who oversaw the case. He recently retired as a deputy assistant director. What's happening there? Uh, information has been passed prior, and this is reward for that, or uh, there is uh, expectation that uh, passage of information is forthcoming. So that's, what, that's what's happening right here. How much money is he holding in his hand? Um, I think we're probably looking at about $2,000, $2, uh, thereabouts. Tai Shin Guo's money and contacts came to the FBI's attention while the Bureau was investigating a different Chinese espionage case. They followed him, tapped his phone, watched his email, and all of that led to Bergerson. In the car, the Pentagon employee and Chinese spy were plotting the handover of secret documents that listed future weapons sales to Taiwan and details of a Taiwanese military communication system. Um, I'm very very, very, very 
reticent to let you have it because it's all classified. Oh, okay. And but I I will let you see it, and you can take all the notes you want, uh, which I think you can do today. But I, I'm. If it ever fell into the wrong hands, and I know it's not going to, but if it ever okay, that's was, then I would be fired for sure. I, I'd go to jail because I violated all the rules. He just described them as classified documents. Exactly. He knows precisely what he's doing. Exactly. He's almost going down your list of requirements for an indictment by a grand jury. And we thank him for that. When it comes to espionage against the United States, is China now the number one threat that we face? I would be hard pressed to say whether it's the Chinese or it's the Russians, but they're one, two, or two, one. Michelle Van Cleve was America's top counterintelligence officer. Working for the Director of National Intelligence, she was in charge of coordinating the hunt for foreign spies from 2003 to 2006. The Chinese are the biggest problem we have with respect to the level of effort that they're devoting against us versus the level of attention we are giving to them. What do the Chinese want from us? Virtually every technology that is on the U.S. control technology list has been targeted. Sensors and optics and biological and chemical uh, processes, these are the things, I, information technologies, across all of the things that we have identified as having inherent military application. The Chinese have stolen technology used in the space shuttle and in submarine propulsion systems. In the late 1990s, a congressional commission found that China now holds the most closely guarded secrets America had. We learned, and the Cox Commission reported, that the Chinese had acquired the design information for all U.S. thermonuclear weapons currently in our inventory. Make sure I understand, the Chinese are in possession today of the designs of all of our nuclear weapons? Yes. How did they get that? The questions of how they acquired it remain, to some extent, unknown. How the U.S. lost its atomic secrets may be unknown, but there are fewer mysteries in the case of Tai Shin Guo and Greg Bergerson. The FBI says that Guo wanted to expand his Louisiana businesses into China, and when he sought permission from Beijing, the Chinese asked for a few favors for their intelligence service. The $2,000 was only part of Guo's development of Bergerson. Guo wined and dined his spy, and Bergerson seemed to have an appetite for espionage. At one dinner, Guo's tab came to $710. Guo took Bergerson to Las Vegas for some shows, and the day of the ride, Guo brought a box of expensive cigars. All the while, Guo lied to Bergerson, telling him that the information was being passed to Taiwan, the U.S. ally. Does that make any difference in the law, whether you're spying for a hostile government or a friendly one? Of course not. Classified information is not allowed to be passed without you know, certain approvals to any foreign government. But I think when you see the information, you can get out of it what you need. You know, you can write all the, you can take all the notes you want. It's just, I cannot ever let anyone know. Because that'll, that'll, I'll, that's my job, man. I get fired for sure on that. Well, not even get fired, I'll go to jail. The recruitment of Bergerson has a familiar ring to Feng Ji Li. Li recruited spies for China as an officer in the Ministry of State Security. The MSS is their CIA. Give me a sense of all the different ways you would persuade someone to spy for China. That should be a long story. I, I've got time. <laughs> okay. In our interview, Lee switched between English and Mandarin. He worked for Chinese intelligence 14 years, recruiting spies in Russia. He's now seeking political asylum in the U.S. Let me say this. Intelligence work is different from other kind of work. When I target 100 people, even if 99 people have refused me, if there is one I persuade... That's enough. That's enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Lee told us that he recruited spies through blackmail and sometimes greed, especially if someone wanted to do business in China. Once, he says, his agents recruited the official photographer for a European head of state that he still won't name. Would you say the MSS spends most of its effort on the United States? How will you win? Definitely, without a doubt. What would some examples be of the kind of information that MSS was interested in getting a hold of? For example, what the uh, President Obama thinks right now. They want to know what President Obama thinks. Yes. If you make me part of, of the owner. Thanks to Greg Bergerson, the Chinese were about to find out just what sort of weapons America intended to sell to Taiwan. The day of that car ride, Bergerson drove Guo and the secret documents to a restaurant outside Washington, D.C. Inside the restaurant, Guo copied the secrets by hand. Out in the parking lot, Bergerson waited with a glass of wine, one of those cigars, and the FBI in tow. As they left, Bergerson just couldn't stop talking. But I, I will be very careful to keep my tracks of course. clean and of no, course. no fingerprints, just like these documents, no fingerprints. I can't afford to, to lose my job. Later, Guo left the U.S. for Beijing. But while he waited for his flight, federal agents got into his bags, photocopied his handwritten notes, and put them back. Guo's notes matched the secret document on the right. But John Slattery, who oversaw the case for the FBI, told us the Bureau didn't make arrests until six months later. But, I mean, this is drop-dead evidence and espionage is occurring, why didn't you arrest them sooner than that? Well, uh, these, these investigations are tremendously complex and tremendously difficult to begin with. The Department of Defense wants you to stop it right Please, away. Please, sooner than later. But the, but the FBI says, listen, we want to make sure we can sustain a conviction here. And, and, and are there other players in this? Turns out there were other players. Guo had another source inside the Pentagon, and Guo was connected to spies on the West Coast who were giving up U.S. space and naval technology. Presumably, the U.S. is doing the same kind of spying in China, but Michelle Van Cleve says America has so much more to lose. I think we're a real candy store for the Chinese and for others in, uh, in terms of technology and commercial products, rather proprietary information, and so we will always be the principal target for them. What is the most serious damage that Chinese espionage has done to the United States? It's the totality of the collection effort. Take a case like this, or, or cases like, like this, traditional espionage, penetration of the, of the interior, couple that with um, industrial and economic collection, couple that with cyber, it greatly concerns me. It greatly concerns me. Well, I hope this all works out. I mean, you are helping me a lot here, but, but, but I don't want anyone to know about our relationship or anything because uh, she get me in a lot of trouble. Bergerson kept saying, I could go to jail, and both men did. In 2008, prosecutors showed them this tape and they pled guilty. Bergerson got almost five years for communicating national defense information. Guo, a naturalized American citizen, is in a U.S. prison doing 15 years for espionage. Prison may have been the best option Bergerson had because after he left the car, Guo pulled out his own tape recorder. We'll never know why he taped the damning conversation, but it is classic spycraft to use blackmail to get it ever deeper and deeper secrets. For every case that is broken, like the Bergerson case, for example, how many others are there that we have no idea about? Oh, isn't that the important question? You never know what you don't know. Um, but we, certainly we have seen such an extensive uh, range of activities by the, by, by the Chinese that it, it should make you very uncomfortable. Since our story first aired, Tai Shen Guo's sentence was cut by two-thirds, partly because of his cooperation and partly because the judge felt that the damage to national security was limited. He's now scheduled to be released a few months after Greg Bergerson.
I'm Scott Pelley. We'll be back next week with a brand new edition of 60 Minutes.